Welcome. Our lecture for today is the tongue. And this is our study outline. By the end of this class, we should be able to define what the tongue is. We should also be able to state the functions of the tongue, the regions, the surfaces it presents, the papillae and its distributions, the taste boards, what do they look like? Where are they embedded? Also the structural components of the tongue, the blood supply, the innovation of the tongue, some clinical application and abnormalities. So we can define the tongue as a unique muscular organ that is located on the floor of the oral cavity. The average length of the tongue is about 10 centimeters and three cm in width or in breadth. The functions of the tongue include that it helps to manipulate food during the process of mastication. The tongue is able to mold the food and place it properly between the upper and the lower dentition so that the chewing process can effectively be carried out. It also helps in rolling food to hit swallowing. They help to mold food in a way that it is easy to be directed and move through to the oral pharynx. You can go and check up a lecture on the pharynx to upgrade in this area. When the food substances are taken into the mouth, the next place after the oral cavity where they're directed to is the oral pharynx. And for them to pass through the oropharynx, they need to be molded in such a way that there can be easy passage. So it is the tongue that has come to play this role by helping to roll or mold the food in such a way that they can be easily moved through the oropharynx before they go down to the laryngopharynx, down to the esophagus, then to the stomach for further digestion to take place. They also perform the function of sensation. And this is because of the fact that they contain taste buds. Taste buds are chemoreceptors that are responsible for the sensation of taste. And these are widespread on the surface of the tongue. And the last function that I have highlighted here is phonetic articulation. I cannot imagine how speaking would occur without the tongue. We know that people that have a deformity of the tongue have alteration in the pronunciation of their words. So we should know that the tongue has a very important role to play in the formation of sounds. The regions of the tongue. The tongue is divided into different regions. We have the apex from the name, it's a narrow anterior hand, and this is where the apex is. This apex is usually directed against the lingual surface of the incisor teeth. In the rest position, maybe you close your mouth, you see that it is the apex that is pointing towards the internal surface of the incisor teeth. We also call it the tip of the tongue. Then we have the body, the region of the tongue that is located behind the apex, and this is the body. Then we have the root from the name, root means a region that is fixed. This is directed posteriorly, and this is at the tail end of the tongue. It is important for us to note that the apex and the body of the tongue are the two regions that are mobile. The root is fixed, it is immobile. The surfaces, the tongue presents two surfaces, and this can be well described in anatomical position. This is the a basis onto which the surfaces of the tongue are being established. So we have the ventral surface. When you stay in an anatomical position, it is the ventral surface, which is also known as the anterior surface, the part that is facing the anterior view. And this tends to be the interior surface of the tongue that forms contact with the oral cavity. If you stay in an anatomical position, you can see that the region that is facing the anterior direction is the ventral surface, the surface that is in contact with the floor of the oral cavity. So this is the image up here. This is the tongue. And this is the inferior surface of the tongue that is termed the ventral surface. The picture that we see on the ventral surface is the frenulum. And this, you can do a cross-examination yourself if you look at the mirror, you see that this ventral surface is attached to the floor of the oral cavity by the frenulum. The frenulum is a fold of 
mucous membrane that tends to connect the ventral surface of the tongue to the floor of the oral cavity. The length also determines the range of movement that the tongue can exhibit. We also have the dosal surface. We've stated that in anatomical position, the dosal surface is the posterior surface, is the surface behind. So if you stay in anatomical position, the surface that will be directed behind will be the dosal surface. And that is the superior rough surface of the tongue. If you open your tongue, you can see it on top. And this surface is marked by a median sulcus that tends to divide this dosal surface face of the tongue into two symmetrical halves, which means that what you have on the right is what you have on the left. So it divides it into the right part and the left part. While you have the frenulum on the ventral surface, you have the median sulcus on the dosal surface, even though it is not connecting the dosal surface with the upper part of the oral cavity. This frenulum is connecting the ventral surface to the floor of the oral cavity. So you can see the disparity that we present, even though they have a form of similarities. Let's go deeper on the dosum of the tongue. The dosum of the tongue is characterized by foramen cecum. It's like a pit that is located around the median plane of the tongue. This is a remnant of the embryonic development of the thyroid gland when there is descent of the thyroid gland from this region. So it tends to live like a remnant around this region. So this is where they actually develop from. They tend to descend down at development proceed. So thereby leaving a pit around this region. And this is termed the foramen cecum. And on both sides of this foramen cecum, we have a shallow groove that is called the terminal sulcus. This terminal sulcus tends to run lateral words on both sides, yeah, by giving it a V-shaped appearance. It tends to divide the dosum of the tongue into the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. So this structural presentation divides it into a bigger anterior two-third and a smaller posterior one third. Let's look at this slide to see what differences that we have in the anterior two third and the posterior one third. For the anterior two third, which tends to be bigger, what you see on the dosum or the dosal surface of the anterior two thirds are basically papilla. And papilla are small projections that are seen on the dosum of the tongue. If you take a mirror and you view the anterior to third of the dosum of your tongue, you will see this roughness. And this roughness occurs as a result of uh, the numerous projection or swellings. Then going to the posterior one third, what you see are overshaped masses of lymphoid tissue. This lymphoid tissue are also called lingual tonsil. They are swellings that are responsible for immune function. So the papillae that we described in the anterior to third of the tongue, we've said that the elevations or swellings of mucous membrane. These papillae are distributed over the dosum of the anterior to third of the tongue. And they are responsible for the detection of different tastes such as salty, salt, bitter, sweet, and so on. Types of papillae. We actually have four basic types that are distributed on the surface of the anterior to third of the tongue. The first one is the circumvallate papillae. We have the foliage papillae. We have the filiform. And the last one is the fungiform. We are going to be taking these papillae one after the other to see what they are, where they are distributed. So the circumvallate papillae, they present a V patterned presentation. And remember when we talked about the foramen cecum and the terminal sulcus, they are the landmark for dividing the tongue into the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third. The circumvallate is just seen running in the same V-shaped pattern in the anterior part of the terminal sulcus. These are the circumvallate papillae. They are very large papillae and they are deeply embedded in the tongue. Even though they are big, they are not projected outwards. They also contain many taste buds, so they can feel the sense of taste. The second one is the folate papillae. They are seen located anterior lateral to the circumvallate papillae. 
this type of uh, papillae are rudimentary in human. They are not well developed. You can see them in mostly maybe rats or rabbits. Each of them contains many taste buds. The filiform, you see them filling the entire anterior dosum of the the tongue. So they are numerous. You see them, they are just well distributed around the whole region. But these papillae do not have taste buds within them. Then the fungiform. The fungiform are short mushroom-like shaped papillae. You see them mostly at the lateral side of the anterior to third of the tongue and also on the tip. So this is how they are distributed. They are highly vascularized, and this tends to give it its red coloration in living subjects. They also contain uh, taste buds. They are not like the filiform that is devoid of taste buds. So those are the four types of papillae that we have distributed on the anterior two thirds of the tongue. We have the circumvallate, we have the folate, we have the filiform, and we have the fungiform. The taste buds are responsible for the sensation of taste. These structures are embedded within the epithelium of the papillae. We've said that the papillae are swellings of mucous membranes seen on the anterior two third of the tongue, but within the epithelium of these swellings, you have taste buds embedded within the epithelium of these swellings. Remember, we said some of them have taste buds, why some of them are devoid of taste buds. So for the ones that have taste buds, you see that these taste buds are embedded within the epithelium of their swellings. Why the ones that are devoid of taste buds, you will not see taste buds within the swelling. The taste buds are not only limited to the anterior to third of the tongue. You may also see them in the soft palate, the epiglottis, and also in the pharynx. The taste bud have constricted hands. This is their configuration. They have both hands constricted and they are made up of three types of cells, which include the neuroepithelial cells, which are the main taste cells. These are the cells that are actually responsible for the sensation of taste and also the supporting or sustentacular cells which are seen around the neuroepithelial cells. And we have the basal cells, as the name implies, are located around the base of the taste bud. These are known as the precursor cells because the lifespan of the neuroepithelial cells, which are the cells that are mainly responsible for the sensation of taste, is short. And as soon as they fade out, the basal cells act like a precursor cells that tends to be transformed into the neuroepithelial cells. So the neuroepithelial cells are chemoreceptor cells, and they are seen around the central portion of the taste buds. They are the one highlighted in black color. They are elongated spindle-shaped cells. This is the taste pore. This is where the food substances come in contact with the taste bud. And on the upper part of the neuroepithelial cells, you can see a like projection or microvilli. By now, we should know the function of this microvilli. If you go to our previous lecture on the morphology of the epithelium, you see that cells that are seen with microvilli tends to increase the efficiency of the functions that they perform. And this is what you see on the neuroepithelial cells. And if you go deep down, in the other hand, they are connected to a sensory or afferent nerve fibers. And it is through these fibers that the taste sensation is transported to the brain for interpretation. The second type of cell that we have listed is the supporting or sustentacular cells. These cells, we say that from the name, they help to guide or protect the neuroepithelial cells. And you see them around the neuroepithelial cells. And they are the one highlighted in green color. You can see them at this hand. They do not have afferent or sensory nerve connection at their hand because they are not responsible for the sensation of taste. They are just there for support. And the third cell, the basal cell, you can see them, they are located at the base of the taste bud. We say that they are precursor cells for the neural epithelial cells, which are the cells that are mainly responsible for the sensation of taste. These neural epithelial cells have a very short lifespan, so they tend to fade out. They can easily be destroyed also when they come in contact with maybe high temperature, and that is when you put hot food in your mouth. So these basal cells are to continuously replace them as soon as they fade out or they die off. They tend to attain maturity and differentiation so as to become the neuroepithelial cells, and they tend to replace them as the need arrives.
The structural component of the tongue. The tongue is made up of two major structures. We have the muscles. The muscles are skeletal type of muscle, and we know classification of muscle can be skeletal, smooth, or cardiac. Skeletal muscles basically are muscles that are striated. They have striation and are connected to bone. The tongue is connected to the higher bone, even though the other hand is not connected to any bone. Then we have the epithelium. So the epithelium are found lining over the mucous membrane of the muscle. So we have muscle, then we have overlining epithelium. We are going to be taking this one after the other to see what they look like, how they run, and also what they do. So the muscle, the muscles of the tongue can further be divided into two. We have the intrinsic muscle and we have the extrinsic muscle. The intrinsic muscle are the muscle that forms the bulk of the tongue, while the extrinsic muscle are muscles that connect the tongue to the surrounding structure. So let's take the intrinsic muscle first. We say that they form the chunk of the tongue. They are four paired. It means that they have one on the right side and one on the left. So if you divide the tongue around the median so-called that we initially discussed, that gives the tongue a symmetrical presentation, which means that what they have on the right will be what they have on the left. What they do basically is that they alter the shape of the tongue. You can lengthen the tongue, you can shorten it, you can coil and uncoil, you can roll your tongue. So when these activities are done, they are done as a result of the action of the intrinsic muscle. And also the intrinsic muscle are named according to how they run. So the names are generated from their running pattern. Let's see what they are, how they run, and where they are placed. The superior longitudinal muscle from the name, it runs in anterior-posterior pattern along the superior surface of the tongue. So it runs from the median septum towards the root of the tongue in the upper part of the tongue. You see this arrangement of fibers also on the other side. So that is why you say they appeared. You have one on the right and you have the other on the left. Then we have the inferior longitudinal muscle. This also runs from the root of the tongue down to the apex, but you see it below the superior longitudinal muscle. So you see this on the right. You also see this on the left. So there are two. You have two superior longitudinal muscles up. You have two inferior longitudinal muscles down, running in an anterior posterior pattern. Then the next one is the verticalis muscle. The verticalis muscle is found in the middle of the tongue. And what they do is that they join the superior and the inferior longitudinal muscle together. So this is like a one side presentation. You have the verticalis joining the superior longitudinal muscle with the inferior longitudinal muscle. And of course, they run in a vertical pattern. You can see that the names fit how they run. Then you have the transversus muscle. This transversus muscle run from the median fibrous septum. The medial septum that we talked about that tends to divide the tongue into symmetrical halves. The fibers of the transversus run from that median septum down to the lateral side of the tongue. So you also have two of them. You can see them running in this pattern from the median septum down to the lateral side. They're on the other side from the medial septum down to the other side. So you can now see that this muscle, they have a pattern by which they move, a pattern by which they move also, help in the development of the names that they are being given. The epithelium lining the tongue. The type of epithelium that lines the tongue is stratified squamous epithelium. And this is the type of epithelium that lines the entire oral cavity. We've said that structures are not just lined with epithelium. They are lined based on the function that that organ would perform. We said that the tongue is located within the oral cavity. And stratified epithelium basically are lined with structures that are prone to injury, insult, or damages. And we know that the oral cavity, we tend to put different types of things into it, like toxins, oatmeal, and some other things. And this tends to expose the oral cavity to stress or insult. And if they are not being lined by a stratified squamous epithelium, 
how would regeneration occur to replace the areas that are worn out or are damaged? And so that is the essence why we have a stratified squamous epithelium. So that if the superior layer is damaged or eroded, the inferior layer will reproliferate to uh, replace the worn out area. So the tongue is also lined with the type of epithelium that we see lining the oral cavity. And this is for a reason and that has been explained. So the extrinsic muscle, we've said that the extrinsic muscle, what they do is that they connect the tongue to the surrounding structure. So it anchors it to the bones around the tongue. They are also four in number and they are also paired. So when we start discussing the muscle, you should know that it is one on the right and one on the left. The function that they exhibit is that they help to change the position of the tongue. You can protrude your tongue, you can retract it, you can depress it, you can elevate it. These are functions that are attributed to the extrinsic muscle. The extrinsic muscle, let's take them one after the other. And it is also important for us to know that merely breaking the names down you should be able to know where these muscles are connected to. So the first one is the genioglossus. Genio means mandible. So it means it connects the mandible to the tongue. So we have two of these. This is the right, and we have the other one on the left side. Ioglossus. The ioglossus connects the higher bone to the tongue. The higher bone with small bone that is located around the base of the head. This is the only bone in the body that is not connected to any other bone. It is just on its own. So fibers arise from its body and the greater corner to be inserted onto the tongue. We have one on this side. On the other side, we also have another ioglossus muscle. Then the styloglossus, from the name, we should know that it is the styloid process. Remember a lecture on the neurocranium when we talked about the pectoral part of temporal bone having different kind of transformation. We talked about the mastoid process, external acoustic meatus, talked about the styloid process. We said, if you remember, that the styloid process are basically for muscle attachment. So the styloglossus connects the styloid process of the temporal bone to the tongue. Then we have the palatoglossus. The palatoglossus connects the palate to the tongue. So we have fibers running from the soft palate behind. Remember the palate in the anterior part it is hard, you can feel it with your tongue. That's the roof of the oral cavity. If you go backwards, you see that you have a soft palate behind. So fibers connecting the soft palate to the tongue is the palatoglossus muscle. Blood supply. The tongue is richly supplied by the lingual artery. The lingual artery is a branch of the external carotid artery. I always like to go to the root. This is the hack of aorta. We said that on the right, we have the brachiocephalic trunk, we have the subclavian and the common carotid. This brachiocephalic trunk on the right further divides into the common carotid artery and also the subclavian. We still have this same presentation on this right side. It is just that it first gives birth to the brachiocephalic trunk before it finally divides to two. And eventually you have two on the right. So we have the subclavian and we have the common carotid. The common carotid will further divide into the external carotid and the internal carotid. Internal carotid is going inside the cranium while the external supply structures around the head and the neck region. So from the external carotid artery, we have a branch of it that is called the lingua artery that supplies the tongue. Tongue could also have secondary blood supply from the facial artery and the ascending pharyngeal artery. This ascending pharyngeal artery, we described it in our lecture on the pharynx when we talked about it as a blood supply to the pharynx. The ascending pharyngeal artery and the facial artery are also branch of the external carotid artery. So they also give secondary branches to the tongue and these are called on xylal branches to create additional arterial supply. The innervation, nerve supply of the tongue are very complex and are also very interesting. For general sensory innervation, general sensory for maybe pain or for touch or maybe for other general sensory activity. Anterior two-third of the tongue and the posterior one-third of the tongue are different. The nerves that innervate them for general sensory 
information are different. And this can be attributed to the fact that their embryonic origin are from different structure. So their innovation is also different. So for general sensory, as we described, the general sensation for anterior to third is the lingual nerve, a branch of the third division of the trigeminal nerve, which is the mandibular nerve. So lingual nerve emerges from the mandibular nerve. And we know the mandibular nerve is the third branch of the trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth cranial nerve. Then the posterior one thought for general sensory innervation is the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the ninth cranial nerve. For special sensory, we know that the special sensory activity that the tongue presents is taste. So for this sense of taste, the nerve that carries this sensation is different from the general sensory innervation. Specifically for taste, in the anterior tutorial, we have the caudal tympani branch of the facial nerve which is the seventh cranial nerve. Why the posterior one-third sensory innervation for taste is also the glossopharyngeal nerve. The nerve supply for motor innervation, that is motor movement. Maybe you want to retract, you want to contract, you want to coil, you want to, any motor activity, the innervation comes from the hypoglossial nerve. So it's a general innervation for both the anterior to third and the posterior one third. But there is an exception to it. And the exception to this is the palatoglossus muscle. Out of all the intrinsic and the extrinsic muscle that we've described in our previous slide, it is only the palatoglossus that is not innervated by the hypoglossal nerve in terms of motor innervation. So the palatoglossus is innervated by the vagus nerve, which is the 10th cranial nerve. So the applied anatomy, the gag reflex is like a gag response, like a contraction at the oropharyngeal region. This is an action that is coordinated by the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve. So this muscular contraction, when you try to put an object at the posterior part of the tongue, you feel a contraction. We could also have paralysis of the tongue. Paralysis of the tongue means motor actions cannot be carried. I remember when we talked about innervation, we said that the hypoglossal nerve is responsible for motor function. So if hypoglossal nerve is damaged, then it will result into the paralysis of the tongue, which means you cannot properly place or hold the tongue in place. So it just drops down posteriorly. Tend to block the hairways, and this can enhance the risk of suffocation. We could have tongue tie. Tongue tie is a congenital abnormality whereby the tongue is tied down to the floor. Remember when we described the surfaces of the tongue, we talked about the ventral surface, which is the surface that forms a connection with the base of the mouth. We said that in the ventral surface, we have a structure that's called the frenulum. This frenulum tends to connect the ventral surface with the floor. And the shorter or the longer that it is, tends to affect the movement of the tongue. So if this frenulum is very short and thick, is going to tie the tongue down to the floor of the oral cavity. And this could result in speech problem, or there could be difficulty in swallowing because structures that is going to help in molding food to allow its easy passage down to the oropharynx, not functional. We could have proglossal from the name, it means a big tongue. So you have a big tongue in the mouth and this tends to impair the function of speech and also swallowing process because it will not be able to manipulate itself to assist in the process of digestion. And it will be so big that production of sounds will be altered. So this can be surgically treated through a process of glossectomy. Glossectomy is a removal of a part or a region of the tongue so as to help in the reduction of the size. Then you could have microglossia. Microglossia means you have a very small tongue, and this is an uncommon condition. It is also a congenital abnormality. You see that also in this instance, you can have difficulty in speech and also swallowing. So I have a tax for you, and I hope that going through this lecture, you should be able to answer these questions perfectly. The first one is for you to explain the component of the tongue. We've said that the tongue is made up of two major structures. So you should be able to 
explain what they are. What are papillae? List and explain the types that you know. Then the third one is to describe the innovations of the tongue. We've said that the innovation of the tongue is very complex, and this is attributed to the developmental process. During the development of form, a lot of events does happen, and this tends to affect the presentation that we now see in the real life. So you should also be able to describe the different innovation, the sensory, general sensory, and motor innovation of the tongue. Then the fourth one, what landmark divides the tongue into the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third? And also state the structural difference between these two regions. This is like a two-in-one question. And I hope you should be able to answer this going through this lecture slide. So thank you for spending your time. Let's continue to increase our knowledge in anatomy through my channel.